Hey, good morning. Welcome to First Free Church. My name's Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here. Glad you're joining us today. Would you stand your feet with me? We're going to worship together. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. That you're here with us. That you're very present, that you're very real. So we invite you here today to have your way. That we'd be changed by your word, by your presence. That we come to know you and, more, and love you more. And we want to come with a heart posture of gratitude, of thankfulness. So would you open our eyes to you today? Would you open our hearts to you today? And we say yes to what you want to do in this room and what you want to do in us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
always present, even when we check out. So we say, have your way here today. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise. As we continue with worship and the study of your word, would you open our hearts and take us deeper today, that we be conformed into your image. Give us compassion, give us grace. We love you and thank you, and everyone said in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thanks for worshiping today. Hello, friends, and welcome to First Free Church. I am super glad each of you are joining us today. I am Fur, your friendly neighborhood connections pastor, and that means I'm here to help you get plugged into this spiritual family. With lots of classes, programs, and events throughout the year that can help you do just that, let's talk about a few of them. Did you know we have a prayer meeting every Tuesday night? That's right, join us each Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. for prayer room in the Upper Lodge. We spend time devoted to worship and praying through the scriptures, and prayer teams are available to meet and pray with you. It's a beautiful space to come and to sit at the feet of Jesus. Come whenever you want, stay as long as you like. All ages are welcome. For more information, visit firstfree.org slash prayer. Membership at First Free is a doorway to family life and service. Becoming a member here means you are committing to being an active part of the First Free family, and we're committing to loving and equipping you as we follow Jesus together. If you're interested in becoming a member of the First Free family, we have a membership class coming up Saturday, March 16th. You can visit firstfree.org slash events to sign up today. Prime timers, ages 55 and up, you're invited to join our St. Patrick's Day luncheon on Thursday, March 14th at noon. We'll be celebrating birthdays in February, March, and April with a St. Patty's themed corned beef dinner with all the fixings. There'll be communion, testimonies, and a trivia game with prizes. It almost makes me wanna be 55 again. Registration's only eight bucks. Sign up today at firstfree.org slash seniors. If you're new here today, I just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. There's a round desk out in the middle of the gym called First Free Central. Stop by on your way out for an awesome free gift. Ask me and the team there any questions you might have about who we are and what we do. If you're online and new, we want to connect with you too. Just text the word welcome to the number on your screen and we look forward to hearing from you either way. That's it for today. Folks, thanks for being here. Let's give a warm welcome to our guest for the weekend, Joel Richardson. Morning. Good morning, everyone online. Uh, so Joel's been here all weekend, been a beautiful weekend of teaching. And uh, I think it was about three years ago now, the Lord just kind of apprehended me and dragged me down this path of studying the end times. What the, specifically what the Old Testament teaches about it, and it was new territory for me, and uh, I stumbled upon uh, Joel, his teaching, and just been a gift to me in my process, um, and over these last few years, he's just become a really, really dear friend, so it's one of those, and you guys know me, I'm pretty honest, well, last week, last week I shared a sermon, I was very honest about some of my disillusionment that because uh, I've been at this for 30 years, you know, and sometimes, whatever, you get to meet certain people, the guys that write the books and all that stuff, and you can get a little disillusioned sometimes with some of the stuff that you see in leadership in the body of Christ. And so Joel has been a gift in many ways, not just his teaching, because I know him. We've become dear friends. I know his heart. I know his life. He's just what you see is what you get. He's authentic. He's real. And it's so just which, been... which Christian leaders, like, really <laughs> let you down? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'd only say those kinds of things on Saturday nights because our Saturday night services aren't recorded. I can say, I can say, you, want, you guys want something raw, come on Saturday night sometime. It's not recorded. I can say, I didn't say it that way. <laughs> I think they misunderstood. Anyway, so I watched the, uh, anyway, I'm just super glad. Joel's got some books uh, out there if you're, if you're looking for something to read. And, you know, many people ask me, like, you know, what can I do? I want to learn more about the end times. Uh, Joel Richardson is, in my opinion, one of the best teachers we have uh, right now on the end of the age and God's heart for Israel. So strongly just recommend all his books and his resources. Um, and I want us to pray for him, though, for a couple things. One, just for the service today. But the other reason I want us to pray for him, and, I, and I'm sincere about this, is um, he's a Kansas City Chiefs fan. 
And uh, she lives in Kansas City. She's a Kansas City Chiefs fan. And so I want to pray for him, uh, for his heart, because it's going to be broken today when the 49ers beat the Chiefs. And, right? So, okay. Yeah, so just so he knows his audience, how many 49ers fans are going to be today? How many? This guy over here is just shaking his head already. I didn't even, I didn't even finish it. He's looking at him shaking. <laughs> how, many 40, how many people are going to be rooting for the 49ers? Just, okay, how many people for the Chiefs? I don't know. It's a pretty split crowd. You get a fight for your right to party. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, though. Joel's watching at my house, so I can give him, help him with some inner healing after the game. He can work through some stuff before he heads home. So, hey, let's just extend a hand towards Joel. Let's pray for him. God, thank you so much uh, for Joel, for his heart, for his life, for the mind that you've given him, for the way he submitted it to you and allowed you to pour into him so that he could pour into us. Thanks, just thanks for his heart, Lord. Thanks for who he is. Thanks that he's real, authentic. Thanks for his love for your people, for his servant-hearted approach to your bride. Pray your blessing on him today. I ask that you'd fill him up even as you pour him out in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, Shane. Amen. You guys, really sincerely, like you guys have such a stinking good pastor. Like really do. <laughs> I've watched him uh, the past few months really just sacrifice himself to do what's right and to try to be a peacemaker and a bridge builder and um, to follow Jesus. And following Jesus, it, uh, it often does come with a real cost, and I've seen him willingly bear that cost, and he just deserves, deserves honor for um, his heart as well. So, again, you guys have a, a genuine shepherd. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to talk today about uh, Israel. We've actually been discussing Israel all weekend. Um, so many different facets of things that you can focus on, so many different passages, so many different things when we're talking about Israel. But as much as possible, I, just, I like to try to just boil it down to the main and the plain, uh, to keep it very simple, and... Um, I'll be honest with you, even, uh, you know, this past year, okay, I, you know, Shane's vulnerable, I'll be a little vulnerable, you know, this past year, um, for any of you who do track with it, you know, we've watched incredible ministry scandals, and I have basically found myself not in the middle of one or two, but actually three, uh, as I've watched a few of my close, very close friends and ministry associates, and then even with uh, IHOP, someone who I always viewed sort of as a spiritual father, someone that I looked to and believed was just a, a you know, person of incredible integrity, uh, someone who I just met with a few months ago, and I looked him in the eye, and I said, you know, there is no one in the earth that I esteem more than you. And to, uh, and to experience the heartbreak and the pain of all of that, and there's been, in my own heart, trying to step back from the emotion of it all and just steer my own heart uh, in the midst of the pain and the disillusionment. I've come to a place where I, um, I've been listening to a lot of people who, you know, some of them actually have left the faith completely, um, apostates. And some of them are just Christians that are wounded and this type of thing. And there's a lot of them out there. And previous to a lot of these things, I would tend to write people off. I would just be like, well, that person left. Now they are that. They're bitter, angry, hurt, wounded, apostate, whatever. But as I've actually listened to a lot of people, formerly who were, you know, brothers and sisters, um, as they've expressed themselves, I've come to a place where I'm like, you know, there's actually, obviously you have to weed through all of these things, but there's brokenness, there's hurt, there's disillusion, there's all those things. But there's also at times wisdom, <laughs> even among those who are in that state. And one of the things that I've come away from, from all of this, is I've said, you know, my faith is, is so important. I, I'm, I'm trying to explain, I want to carefully explain what I'm trying to say here. We live in an age of polarization where we tend to choose teams. 
This has nothing to do with the Chiefs. And, and, um, and so we go like this, like, you know, let's say, you know, I identify, I am a political conservative. So you go, you know, this is my team. So anybody that says anything that is even vaguely this side of me on the spectrum, disregard. I don't have to listen to anything they have to say. They don't have any wisdom. They don't have anything because they're on the other team. And so we just pick teams. And then what people do, they go, there's some controversy in the earth. They just kind of test the wind to see which way it's blowing, to see what their team is saying, to see what the big voices on their team are saying. And then they just choose that. They don't often think through the nuanced complexities of different controversies. They just pick a team. And so we as Christians, we tend to go, there's a Christian answer to everything. Well, if you're, the Bible says this, and you know, and this type of thing. And so none of what I'm saying here is going to make any sense. But basically, this is the place that I've come to, is I am first and foremost a Christian. And by the grace of God, I will die faithful to the one who shed his blood for me. Okay? By the grace of God, I will die faithfully serving Jesus, and all of us will, everyone in this room, we will. But my faith should not be such that it makes me look at someone who is a humanist, who maybe they're, they've never had faith or they've lost faith, and just disregard them. My faith should lead me, quite frankly, to be a good human. <laughs> you go, duh, yeah. But that simple fact sometimes escapes us. We go, no, because the Christian position is this, and I don't care about what all those other people say. The bottom line is, what I'm trying to say is this. If our faith does not lead us to become good humans and good neighbors, then we need to reconsider our belief system. Because the Bible calls us to be good neighbors, not only to those in the church, but to those outside of the church. I want to be a good human. I want to be a good neighbor to everyone. Now, some people you just can't get along with, <laughs> but that's on them, right? My job is to be a good neighbor. So, the message today is standing in solidarity with Israel. This is one of the most important discussions that we can have in the church today because it's one of the most burning pressing, heartbreaking controversies in the earth right now that is affecting millions of lives and hearts. And it's important that we as the church discuss not only the theological foundation for why we should stand in solidarity with Israel, but also just basic elementary reasons. In other words, what does it mean to be a good neighbor right now to the global Jewish community? I guess I did make it make a little bit of sense. Did it make sense? I was, um, I go to Israel a lot. I was in Saudi Arabia um, on October 7th when the Hamas invasion and massacre and the war started. And I was right up in the northwest corner of Saudi Arabia. So I was right li literally in a hotel where you could see the, the, border crossing gate into Jordan, which meant we're only like 15 miles from the border of Israel, and you could actually look right across the Red Sea and see the city of Eilat, um, which I lived in for several months, almost a year, like back in the early 90s. And it was, it's so weird, this is a side note, but I used to, I would be in Eilat, early 90s, young guy, I was like early 20s, and I would look across to the south of the Red Sea into Jordan, and I'd been to Jordan, but then I would look to the dark, closed mountains of Saudi Arabia. And I would be like, whoa, that's where the radical Muslims live. And then I said, Lord, someday I ask that you would get me in. And it's just weird all these years later to be down there in Saudi Arabia looking up at Israel and going, it's not dark down here. These people are great. They're welcoming, loving, fun, friendly. I've got friends down here. It's just... Life is, is strange. But anyway, we're looking up at Israel, and um, my phone starts blowing up, and I'm supposed to be leading a tour, so i got to maintain my composure with everyone, and my heart is absolutely breaking as I'm watching videos of families being slaughtered 
because when Hamas did that, immediately they flooded TikTok with videos of murder. And there was a big concert down there on the border, you know, thousands some odd kids, and they just massacred those kids. And they took hundreds of them as kidnapped prisoners. You see these little girls, the age of my daughters, screaming with terror as they're being dragged away on motorcycles by these Palestinian terrorists. And again, families breaking bread. It was a holiday called Simchat Torah, which is when the Jews celebrate the giving of Torah. And then they get drunk. They go up to the Western Wall and get drunk and dance around with a Torah scroll. Sometimes I want to be Jewish. No, just kidding. Um, no, it's fun, though. Sometimes, they, sometimes those religious Jews know how to party. But um, is it okay that I just said that? But No, yeah, they do. They dance around in the Western Wall. And, but uh, anyway, they're breaking bread, and terrorists burst into their home and start killing families. Like I'm like... I don't care if you're Muslim, Jewish, Christian. If you're a human, you should be able to look at that and say, this is satanic evil, period. It's not about sides. It's not about, I'm Muslim, I'm Christian, I'm American, I'm Israeli, I'm Palestinian, I'm Arab. It, none of that matters. That is evil, period. It's from the pit of hell. And my heart was just breaking. And by the way, um, I mentioned this in the first service, but... In 2020, just before COVID, we had taken a tour group to Israel, and it was a tour group, a very special tour group, where we were trying to help the global church understand the situation that Israelis live with every day, their security situation. So we took them not to the places where Jesus did this or that, or, you know, to the, to the um, Mount of Beatitudes of the Church of, um, you know, any of these things, any of the historical sites. No, we took them to the borders of Israel. We took them up to the border of Lebanon, this town called Metula, this little village called Metula. And we looked out into Lebanon, and our guide explained how Hezbollah, which is the terrorist organization that essentially runs, controls Lebanon, they were burrowing under the town, under the border. For years, they were tunneling under the limestone with plans on eventually popping up on the other side and doing what we saw on October 7th, massacring families, kidnapping people, and engaging in this horrific terrorist act. And, you know, I just thought to myself, can you imagine being a little Israeli kid? Can you imagine just, just being Jewish? You know, you go, whatever, you know, my family was from Hungary or Poland or whatever. And you visit, you go to Hungary that used to be your family property. You go, this is where my uncle and my father's father and, you know, this is where my family comes from. This is the property that they owned. But now it's not ours because my whole family was murdered during the Holocaust. And you go and you have your story and you say, so then we moved to Israel because we just wanted some place to raise our families where people weren't trying to kill our kids. But we moved to Israel, and they're burrowing under our town because they want to pop up and kill us all in the middle of the night. Where in the world can we simply go where someone is not trying to, not just hate us, not just where there's racism, but where they're literally trying to kill us? Imagine the emotion of that. And they're burrowing under their town. I mean, literally monsters coming up out of the ground. Like, it's just, it's insane what they live with. So we're trying to help the church to understand this. And then we also went down to the border of Gaza. We went to a little village there. It's like, it's not a, Mo, it might have been a Moshav. If you know what that is, it's like a farming community. But it's a very small community. I mean, it was only like 100 some odd, maybe 200 people, about the number of people that would fit in this, this row. And we went down there, and this guy gave us a tour. Beautiful little community. I love Israeli technology, irrigation, and all this stuff. I, I, I actually, I love the culture. Um, but, you know, it's a very secular community. It's not religious at all. And the guide explained how all of his kids have to go through regular therapy because they all have really severe PTSD. Because even at a young age, some of them in kindergarten, their kindergarten was hit with a rocket. How many people here ever had their kindergarten get hit by a rocket while you were studying ABCs? You know what I'm saying? And this is what they lived with. And it was just, it was very moving. It was very touching. And then, you know, there was a lot there. And then we, we all painted these little tiles and little prayers. And we glued it up on this wall that faces Gaza. And it's, you know, where 
sending our prayers and positive feelings to them and peaceful sentiments and so forth. And it was a very impactful thing, this whole tour. And then as my phone was blowing up on October 7th, I was texting friends and I found out that that little village had over 20 people murdered that day. And I was like, I wonder if it was any of the people that I met. I wonder if it was any of my host's children, you know? And it was just like, these are real lives, real families, regular people, just trying to find a place in the world where they won't be killed. And for that, they're being killed. And it's just absolutely evil. And then to see the response of the world, hundreds of thousands in, in um, London and New York City and na- in cities all across Europe. Even There was even an anti-Israel protest in Austin, Texas. You know, and it's not just Palestinians and Muslims and, and uh, so forth, but it's the, it's the Western world is joining them. And it's the strangest thing, by the way, to see a bunch of like pro-LGBT folks out there chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, which is a slogan basically means it must be free of Jews. It's literally a call for genocide. And they're standing shoulder to shoulder with these Palestinians. And I go, guys, don't get me wrong, but LGBT for Palestine, it would be like chickens out in the street protesting in favor of Kentucky Fried Chicken. You're like, there's some logical problems here. But whatever, that's beside the point. The Western world joining them, it's so heartbreaking that there's a blindness. There's, there's literally like a, 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 um, a clinical collective psychosis that has affected the whole world. You look at it, you go, it's insanity. Any human should be able to recognize that massacring people who are breaking bread with their families for no reason and kidnapping and raping their children, that's wrong. But in the Western civilized world, they're celebrating it. And I'm just so emotional. And then I get on social media in the weeks that follow and I see Christian pastors and theologians who are actually supporting Israel. I could open up Twitter right now this morning. Let me see if I can find it. I blocked the guy. I probably won't be able to find it. And the guy's like, you're just a shill for Israel. I'm like, because I don't want people to get slaughtered. I'm some t- and I forget the word he used. But it's just, there is an irrational racism and hatred that has gripped the globe. And there are even, I would say probably half of the church is actually theologically laying out reasons why it's okay. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. My, um, I told the story, my daughter, who's now 19, a few years ago, just it seemed like a few years ago, she was a sophomore in high school, and she goes, Dad, I don't understand. She said, all of my friends in high school, they all know racism is bad. Like, every high school kid knows racism, bad. She said, but all my white friends and all my black friends all agree that racism is bad, but they all are racists openly toward Jews. Why is it that they make fun of, that they bully, that they harass, and that they are racist toward all the Jewish kids in the school? Why is that? I don't get it. What's going on? And I'm like, honey, unless you understand spiritual dynamics, unless you understand there is a very real Satan, a very real devil, and an army of demons that are behind the scenes playing people like puppets. There's no way to explain it. And people be like, no, I can explain it because the Jews are bad. You know, they, they control Hollywood or this. And they go to all of these different conspiracy theories. But here's the thing. There are actually academic fields devoted and universities dedicated solely to studying this phenomena, this pan-historical phenomena, because it, it, it perme- I mean, throughout human history, hatred of the Jewish people has been a thing. And you get all of these secular scholars that give their lives to understand it, and they go, but here's the mystery. Right in the middle of this field of study is this massive, dark hole 
this mysterious thing that no one can explain. And the reason is because they go, well, they tried to kill the Jews, you know, let's say in Russia throughout this whole period. The reason then was thus and such. But then the reason for the Holocaust was completely different. And then you go to a different period. There's a different reason. Why do they hate the Jews now? The reason is never the same. There is no consistency whatsoever. And they go, something, something, is, there's something unexplainable here. And so there's this statement. It's a play off of a statement from Nietzsche. And um, this uh, guy, Weinrich, um, I forget what his first name is. He's a scholar of anti-Semitism. He said, staring into the Holocaust or simply staring into this long continuum of hatred of the Jewish people, it's like staring into a black abyss and hoping that it doesn't stare back. Unless we recognize that the Bible is true, that there is a very real unfolding plan, and God says that when, he, when Jesus returns from heaven, all of Israel will be saved. And his story of redemption will not be complete. It's not okay that just all of the Gentiles are here at church. That's a beautiful part of the story. But the story is not complete until the remnant of the Jewish people throughout the earth all turn to their king and their Messiah. And we all together as Jews and Gentiles together worship him under his headship. The story's not done until that happens. So the Bible has this plan... And you can't understand this hatred, this rage against the Jewish people unless you recognize that there is a very real devil. And in the midst of that black abyss, there are eyes staring back. A very intelligent, malevolent, evil entity that is playing the world like a puppet master. And you go, okay, well, that's the world. And I just go, guys, no, I just said half of the church is being played by the devil. And we need to understand what the scriptures say. We need to understand reality. So with that said, let's go ahead and uh, jump into the scriptures. I just want to start with some very basic principles, which is that the Lord, sh begin with this principle, the Lord shows favoritism to the poor. The gospel, the good news that we all are stewards of, the, you know, the message that, the, that we as Christians, as followers of Jesus, the message that we have for the world, we are people of the gospel. What is that good news? What is that message? It is a message of, yes, Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins. Yes, he has come. Jesus has come, but he is also coming back. The gospel is not complete if you only emphasize one of those statements. The gospel is more than just John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's good news. That's how you enter into the kingdom. But the rest of the message is the king is coming back and establishing a kingdom on the earth. He's putting an end to this insanity. All of the corruption, the brokenness, the wickedness, the things that make us groan, pant and yearn for something better. This age, the world's not coming to an end. This age is coming to an end. This system is coming to an end. The king is coming back and he is going to restore Eden. He's going to undo the curse. He's going to re renew the earth. All things will be made new and we will be clothed. Even our bodies will be clothed with immortality. He didn't just come to spiritually save our souls so that we can go to heaven and become ghosts forever. He came to redeem all of creation. In the beginning, the heavens and the earth, he made all things, and it was good. And he's going to restore and renew creation. Okay, so this is the gospel that we have. It's the best news imaginable. There is no other message that you can articulate or frame that's better. There's nothing that more perfectly meets the deepest spiritual longings and the emotional needs of the human heart. This age is exhausting, absolutely crippling, but we're looking forward, and no one looks forward to deliverance more than the poor, the broken, the needy, the forgotten, the hated, the marginalized, the sick, the lonely, the rejected, the bullied, the lame, the mute, the deaf, you know, those with disabilities or, you know, any of these things, the broken, 
The brokenhearted, the gospel is for them. And ultimately, the poor of the earth are those who, whether they even really articulated in their minds or not, they are yearning for something better. All of us have this cry for that age to come. We have a cry for that more perfect world. All of us intuitively in our spirits know that something is fundamentally broken with this world. Something is wrong. And the gospel holds out the promise that it's not always going to be this way. But we don't cry out. We don't groan. We don't yearn unless we are poor. If we have everything, if we're powerful and successful in every which way, we don't have any needs, we're fine with this kingdom now, then we don't really groan. The gospel doesn't really resonate. It doesn't connect with our hearts. But the gospel is good news of deliverance for the poor of the earth. So that is the essence of the gospel, the essence of the message that we all rally around. And there's so many verses, so many passages. I mean, this theme permeates the entire Bible. I'm just going to highlight a couple of verses here. Psalm 72, verse 11 through 14. All kings, let all kings bow down before him. Kings, the powerful, the exalted The lofty, let them humble themselves before the one true king. All nations across the boards will serve him. For he will deliver the needy when he cries for help. When the needy cry for help, the Lord hears the cries of the needy. The afflicted also, and the one who has no helper. God is a helper to the one who has no other help, who has nothing else, who has no friends who has no good neighbors, the Lord will hear their cries. He will have compassion on the poor and the needy. The lives of the needy he will save. Who does he rescue? He will rescue their life, the needy, from oppression and violence. And their blood, their persecution is precious in his sight, and it will be precious in his sight. Jesus himself actually validated the fact that he was ministering to the poor and healing the sick and unloosing the bonds of affliction, he pointed to that as proof of the fact that he is the Messiah prophesied by the Hebrew prophets, specifically by Isaiah. So here's Jesus in the synagogue, and he stands up, Luke 4, 18, and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why has the Lord sent me, anointed me, commissioned me, empowered me? He says, he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. The gospel is for the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. And his healing during his ministry was a foreshadow, a foretaste, a glimpse of the ultimate deliverance from the captives that's coming. I am fully charismatic. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit today. I believe in praying for the sick. But if we are honest, we have to admit that at the vast majority of the healing meetings, most people leave not without any miracles. I've seen miracles. I've seen real stuff happen. But the reality is in this age, most often, injustice prevails. Sickness prevails. Suffering prevails. And we pray for the sick now, and the the Lord gives us deposits, down payments, glimpses. But all of these things are signs that are pointing to the day when Jesus will come back, and every single last one of us who names the name of Jesus will be completely healed, 100%. No one's leaving the healing meeting with their headache 50% better, okay? Everyone, all of the captives will be set free Again, who name the name of Jesus. That is good news. That is good news. And yes, we continue to contend. We pray for the sick now. But we understand that the ultimate healing, everything that he bought for us on the cross, its ultimate fulfillment is when he returns at the resurrection. Okay? Because you'll have some people that say, it's God's will to heal every single solitary time. And I go, well, then his will is thwarted quite a lot of times. I don't understand the mystery of these things. And I know it's his heart He wants us to be healed, but the timing is the issue, the question. The family of God, we specifically are comprised of the weak and the foolish. I love this, Matthew 11, 25 through 26. At that time, Jesus just burst out in praise. He looks up to heaven. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have chosen to hide these things from the wise and the intelligent 
and you've revealed them to the lowly, to the babes, to the infants. Elsewhere it says, I thank you, Father, you have chosen to reveal these things to the weak and the foolish things of the world in order to shame that which is wise. We, in this church today, all of us are collectively a family of weak and foolish things. This is a family of fools. Welcome. <laughs> Some of us are more foolish than others. I'm referring to myself. He says, yes, Father, this was pleasing in your sight. Okay, the gospel, overwhelmingly from the beginning to the end, it's for the poor. Now, my next statement is a controversial statement, which is that from a biblical perspective, the Lord, at the end of the age in particular, views and treats and speaks of Israel as poor. I was going to call this message poor Israel, but it sounded weird. But from the Lord's perspective, Israel is poor. And you go, how is that? They go, Jewish people, you know, I got Jewish neighbors. They're very successful people collectively as a people. You know, they really control or, you know, they're very successful in the banking industry. Have you heard of the Rothschilds? I mean, they're an incredibly wealthy. There's all kinds of wealthy Jewish families and, and they're in Hollywood and this, that, and the other thing. I go, yeah, there's very successful, intelligent people. I get that. There's a blessing that rests on them collectively, but from the Lord's perspective, they're poor because of what I've already mentioned. They are the single, the single. Now think about this. Um, in all of the earth, the population, they are like less than a fraction of 1% of the total global population throughout history, like less than 1%. And yet they are overwhelmingly the single most targeted, hunted, hated, murdered, persecuted people group in the history of the world. Nothing, no one else even begins to come close. And it's for that reason. And they understand that. They, you know, they know their own history. Most Christians don't know Jewish history. We don't even know our own history. But they're aware of it, and they live with that identity. And it's for that reason that the Lord views and treats Israel as poor. Now, I've got a picture here of David fighting Goliath. It's such a powerful, powerful biblical story. And I love this picture because Goliath is sitting there, leaning back, laughing, mocking, scoffing. He's the giant. Let's say he's 10 feet tall, whatever. He's bigger, stronger, stronger. Um, but he's also a mocker. And then you've got the opposite side, David. He's the youngest of his brothers. He's the least, you know, from a, in terms of height and good looks and age and all of those things, he was overlooked. He was dismissed. He's the little, littlest of the brothers, but he's got a heart of a lion and he's got a fierce, just like confidence in God. And over here is this mocking giant and everyone just loves and connects to this story because with one little stone, he takes down the giant, the mocking, scoffing giant. Everyone who reads this story, I'm just going to go out on a limb. I'm going to say everyone who has ever read this story identifies with David, the underdog, which is why there's such a high percentage of 49ers fans in the room, but that's beside the point. Everyone identifies with the underdog. I'm just kidding, but I will be honest. That's really why I was so sad that the Lions lost, and I feel so bad for the Bengals this year. But anyway, everybody wants to root for the underdog. It's a beautiful story when the underdogs win. Come back, right? And the Chiefs were that a few years ago. But no one really, no one really identifies with Goliath. Like, no one reads the story and like, darn it. I was really hoping that he was going to crush that little punk. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? No one identifies with the bully. There's plenty of us that are bullies or have been bullies, but even bullies usually, inside our hearts, I'm convinced the vast majority of people in church identify as broken, hurting, lonely, poor, whatever. And that's why we all identify with the underdogs, and that's why the gospel resonates with all mankind. But now this story... It's been appropriated, it's been taken and twisted and changed and utilized in so many ways by so many people because it has a deep emotional impact. Um, there's a, I was going to use this analogy earlier, there's this old story, uh, no, it's a movie, I'm not even going to 
use that for the sake of time. Go to the next slide. <laughs> we'll just jump right into this. Today in Israel, the Palestinian cause, the Palestinians have very, very successfully preempted, they've appropriated the David and Goliath narrative. They just switch out the players, and they go, we are the suffering little underdogs. I guarantee you this picture was staged. The Palestinians are very good. They understand that there is a war going on, and that war is not just a physical war. That kid's not going to throw a rock and tear down, but it's a, it, it evokes emotion and support for people who don't know what's going on in Israel. For some reason, the whole world's supposed to have an opinion about Israel. And so they just see pictures like this. It's not only a real war, it's also a propaganda war. It's a war for the minds and the hearts of the world. And they've been very, very good on TikTok and social media and YouTube and, you know, blah, 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 of controlling the narrative. Because, listen, whoever controls the narrative wins. Whoever controls the narrative wins wins. And they've been very good at taking this, this narrative. So here, the narrative is essentially this. The Palestinians are these poor, suffering um, community of, um, well, there's a lot there that today really resonates, but it's the poor, suffering Palestinians against the juggernauts. Look at their tanks. Look at their protective military equipment. They're strong. They have this incredible military, all the technology, all the wealth. So they frame Israel as the Goliath and the Palestinians as the poor little David, and then everyone goes, oh, well, who am I going to stand with? Little David, right? The reality is with any war today, there's the real war and there's the propaganda war. And if you don't fight the propaganda war, you're, you, you, you're lost, period. Now, after October 7th, as I said, we watched the nations of the earth in the streets and cities, London, New York, all across the world, Istanbul, one and a half million people. But then our Western kids, universities join them, and forgive me guys, but our kids today are getting half of their education from TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, or whatever, you know, even everybody is. No, but who, who here even listens to, like, ABC, NBC, CBS News, anyway, you know what I mean? Like, we get it from these videos and different things. And everybody largely bought into the Palestinian narrative. They thought it was the justice issue of the day. We need to kick those occupying European occupiers out. You know, the, the, the poor indigenous brown people, the Palestinians, um, are suffering. So I'm, I'm bringing in some of the modern-day... Marxism and critical race theory and different things that are the anti-colonialism that's in our universities. But the reality is, first of all, the Israelis are not Caucasian. Israelis are incredibly diverse people. You've got black Ethiopian Israelis. The Israelis, for the most part, are just as brown as their Palestinian Arab neighbors. But the reality is the Israelis are the original indigenous peoples. If you go to Hawaii today, the locals are the Hawaiians. They were the ones that were there first. It's the Portuguese and the Caucasians and the Japanese and, you know, all these others that have come and all the tourists. But the original indigenous people are the Hawaiian, um, how do you say it, Polynesian islanders or whatever. In Israel, the indigenous peoples are the Israelis. And you can say to a degree, because they've been there so long, the Arabs are there as well. But anyway, it's just these various templates that are taught in Western universities, they try to transfer it to this situation, and it's just wrong. It's just not historically accurate. We know biblically God gave Israel, they've been there for thousands of years. They were kicked out by the Europeans, by the Italians. And then they return to their homeland because that's exactly what the Lord said they would do. And the reality is after the Holocaust, they have every stinking right to protect and defend themselves. They have reasons to not trust us as the Gentiles. And so after the Holocaust, they came back to Israel and they said, what did they say? What was the expression that came out of the Holocaust? Never again. But the never again, a lot of people don't understand it, never again was not the cry of the world. Oh, we're never going to let that happen to them again. It was the cry of the Jewish community that said, never again, never again are we going to let those Gentiles pull this insanity. We're going to go back to our homeland, 
And yes, we're going to build a strong military, and they have every legitimate right to do so, but their, their military is not the purpose. It's not an offensive military. They're not planning on invading and conquering Iraq. They have no intentions on conquering and invading Egypt. They built a military to protect themselves. It's defensive so that they can have a place where they can raise their children without being murdered. And they have every legitimate, moral, legal right to do so. Right? Like, this is just basic. So we need to recognize the reality. Hamas, on the other hand, is an Islamic, apocalyptic death cult. No, it's a liberation movement. It's a freedom movement. As part of the very charter of Hamas... The very charter of Hamas, their constitution, it says, there's this alleged prophecy from Muhammad that says the day of resurrection will not come until the Muslims fight against the Jews and kill them. Until there are only a few Jews left hiding themselves behind a tree or a rock, and then the tree or the rock will cry out and say, oh, Muslim, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. And then it goes on and it says Hamas exists to fulfill this mandate. Like, think of it. The American Constitution, it enshrines principles like equality and freedom and liberty. And yes, we have fallen short of these things many times, but that's what we aim for. Their Constitution, what they're aiming for, is exterminating all of the Jews. That's not an issue of justice. That is a satanic, demonic, Islamic, apocalyptic death cult. And that's what's driving that's what's driving the war. You have, you have a largely secular people with a, you know, a segment are religious, of course, and they just simply want to live and survive. Now, let's jump into the scriptures. Joel chapter 3 is an incredibly important chapter, an incredibly important prophecy, and it's speaking of the very hour that we live in right now. Now, Joel prophesied, let's say, 29 I might have it wrong. Yeah, I think about 2,900 years ago, almost 3,000 years ago. And in, in about 200 years after Joel, the Babylonians would come in, invade the, the kingdom of Judah, kill most of the people, and drag a few away as exiles. Pretty much, you know, just another example of Jew hatred throughout history. And he hadn't even, he lived before that, but he was actually prophesying after that when Israel would be restored. It's really amazing if you think about it, when he was prophesying what he was talking about. And he says, behold, in those days and at that time, when? When I restore the fortunes of Judah in Jerusalem. After Israel is restored back to their nation, we are living in the days right now when Israel, the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem have been restored. Right now, we, everyone in this room is living in an age just on the tail end of the restoration of Israel. After they were destroyed by the Romans, by the way, there was, there's been two destructions. Both times they returned to their land. And he says, at that time, what's going to happen? The Lord says, I'm going to gather all of the Gentiles. I'm going to gather all of the nations and bring them up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is simply uh, referring to Jerusalem. The valley of Jehoshaphat runs right through the middle of Jerusalem. And then he says... Then I will enter into judgment there. So here's Yahweh God Almighty saying that after Israel is restored, I'm, there's, I'm going to allow this rage and this hatred of Israel so much so that they will actually invade the land of Israel. And he says, there I will enter into judgment with them. On behalf of who? Why? My people, my inheritance, Israel. So we all as Christians know that Jesus is coming back we know that he's coming back, and here, and we know that Jesus is Yahweh God Almighty. We know that he is the God of all creation. He's coming back in blazing fire to save us. But here in Joel, he comes back to save his people Israel, my people, my inheritance, Israel. And then it, he lists the sins of the Gentiles. They've scattered them among the nations. Right now, in Israel, there's still a cry because there's still 100-plus surviving kidnapped. They've been over 100 days kidnapped in Gaza. Bring our children back. 
all this evidence that they've been raped and tortured and so forth, bring our children back. October 7th, in so many ways, was a small prophetic foreshadow of that which is to come. In a horrible, horrific way, all of the elements of what Joel is describing, we saw on October 7th, they came, they exiled my people, they kidnapped them, prisoners of war, however you want to say it. He says, they've scattered my people among the nations. Under the Antichrist, something far worse than October 7th is coming. And they've divided up my land. This morning, I, I read this in first service, I'll read it again. Literally, I mean, I didn't plan this. This is, this is, um, this morning, as I was getting ready to preach this message, 3,000 years ago, the prophet Joel said he's going to judge the nations because they divided up my land. This morning, open source intel, a site that I sometimes check, it says, breaking, in the United States, preparations are underway to recognize a Palestinian state without Israeli consent. Anthony Blinken recently instructed his office team to prepare organized groundwork for the possibility, it's not set in stone, but they're talking about it, American or even international recognition of a Palestinian state unilaterally without the coordination of Israel. Israeli sources have expressed deep concern. Right now, today, they're talking about dividing up the land. And by the way, you go, well, what's wrong with that? Why don't, you know, once you give the Palestinians recognition, legitimacy, then according to international law, they can, they can get nukes. They can get any weapon they want. You're pretty much guaranteeing a war. You're pretty much guaranteeing a war in which millions of people will probably get killed. That's, that's what we're, that's what our government is doing right now. And the UK has um, expressed their interest in doing that as well. They've divided up my land and then it uses the language of human trafficking. What do they do after they scatter the people among the nations? They have trade, they have cast lots for my people. They've gambled for humans. They've traded a boy for a prostitute, sold a girl for wine so that they may drink. And then in verse four, it says, the Lord says, what have you against me, O Tyre and Sidon and all you regions of Philistia? He basically points out Lebanon, Hezbollah, Philistia, Gaza, Hamas. The Lord goes, what have you against me, Hezbollah and Hamas? Like, again, 3,000 years ago, the prophet Joel, in very specific ways, explained and described the days that we're living in right now. Like, this is not vague. This is not general. This is very, very specific. Now, I want to look at Jesus' Olivet Discourse. This is his sermon on the end times, where he explains the end times Matthew 24, verse 21, he says this. He says, for then there shall be a great tribulation. We all know the term, the great tribulation. That's when the Antichrist is going to come after us as Christians. And I go, yes, that's true. But the Olivet Discourse in which Jesus talks about the great tribulation, it actually has a very specific geographic epicenter. The tip of the spear, if you will, is Israel. It's Jerusalem. He says, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since there was a nation until, um, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. In other words, it will be an unparalleled, unprecedented, horrific time of tribulation such as has never been. You go, worse than the Holocaust? Jesus said something is coming that's even worse. And he goes on, he says, when you see these things, let those who are in Judah and Jerusalem flee to the mountains. So he's referring to the people that live in modern day Israel. There's going to be a great tribulation. Yes, it will have global impact. But the tip of the spear, the epicenter, is Israel. And then, <coughs> let me tease this out. Put up a, uh, the, the next picture of uh, Jerusalem. So this is a picture of the Temple Mount. It's interesting because... That's what's actually on the screen in the blue, but this is a little better picture. So let's say you all are on the Mount of Olives, which is opposite, and you're looking across the Mount of Olives, and I'm up here, up on the Temple Mount. That's where is the Dome of the Rock, the Golden Dome Mosque. You're looking from the Mount of Olives across, and in between us is something called the Kidron Valley. 
The Kidron Valley is also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. It's the tomb of Jehoshaphat's down there in the valley. The Lord says, I'm going to bring all the nations up against Jerusalem to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will judge the nations. Jesus, when he gave the Olivet Discourse, his sermon on the end times, it's called the Olivet Discourse because he was on the Mount of Olives. So he, you guys are on the Mount of Olives. They left the Temple Mount. They walked across the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives. Jesus gives a sermon. They're looking across at the Temple Mount. When you look across at the Temple Mount, the blue circle, I've got that around what's called the Eastern Gate. Sometimes it's called the Messiah Gate or the Golden Gate. Sometimes it's believed that the Messiah will enter that gate when he comes back. To the right of it in Jesus' day was something called the Sheep Gate. Okay, to the left where the arrow is pointing, go to the next slide. This is an aerial view of ancient Jerusalem. I've got the big yellow oval is the Mount of Olives. You guys are all on the Mount of Olives. You're looking across the Kidron Valley to the Temple Mount. To the south of the Temple Mount is another valley. What's that valley called? Hinnom. Hinnom Valley. In Greek, it's Gehenna. This is the place that was used as the basis for the concept of the lake of fire, of hell. It was the place where they would throw trash and dead bodies, and it was always burning, it always stunk. And they were like, that's, that's a, it's an object, it's a picture of hell. Okay, so now we're going to look at another part of the Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew 25. The Olivet Discourse is Matthew 24 and 25. And this parable of the sheep and goat judgment, again, they're up on the Mount of Olives, they're looking across at the Temple Mount, and Jesus says this, he says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, when he comes back from heaven in glory and all of his angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. His glorious throne, by the way, is, according to the words of the prophets, the throne of his father, David. Jesus, our king, is coming back to restore the royal Jewish monarchy. Sounds kind of weird when you say it like that, doesn't it? But that's what the Bible teaches. Jesus will come back to restore the throne of his father, David, and restore the kingdom of Israel. He will restore Eden, and it will be essentially like a combination of a restored, even amplified, better than Eden, combined with a restored, amplified kingdom of David, at the time, or Solomon, at the time of its greatest glory. Mix Eden and the kingdom of David together, and put Jesus on the throne, and that's what the prophets describe in the age to come. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. The knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the ocean floor, and the Torah will go forth from Jerusalem. This is how the prophets describe it. He says, all the nations will be gathered before him. So he comes back from heaven in blazing glory with all of his angels, to Jerusalem, he restores the throne of his father in Jerusalem, of his father David in Jerusalem, and all the nations will be gathered before him. Jesus is explaining to his disciples Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3, the Lord said, I will gather all the nations and bring them up to Jerusalem, the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will sit to judge the nations, the Gentiles. Here Jesus says, all the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the sheep one from another, as, the, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, he puts the sheep on his right. What's on the right? As they're looking at the Temple Mount, the sheep gate. To the goats, he says, on the left. What's to the left? Gehenna, the lake of fire. He says he'll put, the king will say to those on his right, come, you are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom the everlasting, increasing kingdom that the Father has prepared for you from before the foundation of the world. Why? Why will you inherit the kingdom? Because Jesus says, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I was in a time of need, and you were a good neighbor. I was naked, and you clothed me. I don't know where all these naked people are. Like people, they go like, I got a naked ministry. Yeah, we just clothe people. Got to take care of those naked people. I was sick and you visited me. 
I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and they say, Lord, we saw a lot of Jews that were hungry. We saw a lot of addicts that were thirsty. We saw a lot of poor that were broken. When did we see you hungry, thirsty, naked, needing all of these things? And the king will answer them and he'll say, as you did it to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, these brethren of mine, as you did it to my family members. Guys, Jesus was not simply Jewish in history. He is Jewish now. And he's coming back in the body of a Jewish man, and he will forever inhabit the body of a Jewish man, Jesus, son of Mary, from Nazareth. And he will restore the throne of his father, David. He says, as you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Because I was thirsty and you didn't do anything. I was hungry. I was in one of the most desperate, broken, lonely, hurting times of my life and you did nothing into the lake of fire with you. Now, you could say, hold on now, Joel. We're going to send an email to Pastor Shane because you're teaching heresy. The Bible says we're saved. We enter the kingdom or we're cast into the lake of fire based on our faith in Jesus, not by works. I go, I agree with that. I'm a son of the Reformation. I embrace all of the tenets of any evangelical statement of faith that you can find. But I also know the Bible is very clear that if we have the kind of faith that does not produce fruit, faith without works, as the scriptures say, is dead. It's not, the kind, it's not real faith. It's not the kind of faith that saves you. And when you have a people that the scriptures prophesied that once again there would be one final absolute tsunami of demonic rage and hatred and you do nothing, maybe you don't have a real faith. And we all have to ask ourselves constantly. Paul goes, test yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. How do you test yourself? You look at the fruit of your life. Am I actually living out what I say I believe? Because one of the greatest things we can all do is lie to ourselves. And we need to take genuine inventory in an introspective way, look at our lives and say, right now, Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation, it's starting in many ways right in front of us. I want to be the type of Christian that is a good neighbor. It's very simple. And the Lord says, if you're not a good neighbor, maybe you're not even real. Maybe you're not even a real follower of Jesus. And I know that's a scary, harsh kind of statement to make, but that's what Jesus said. As you did to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. God identifies with his people. And the reality is when he comes back, all of Israel that remains will look upon the one they have pierced. And he will, they will weep and mourn and break and realize all of you crazy Gentiles were right to some degree. And they will, he will pour out his spirit of grace on them in the same way that he poured out his spirit of grace on us. He, and all Israel will be saved, as it says in Romans 11. And they will be our brothers and sisters forever. Okay, so they are right now, the majority are not believers. There's always a remnant that are, but the majority are not. But the time is coming when they will be. All right? So we need to understand what the scriptures say. We need to understand the intricacies of what's unfolding. But behind it all, guys, let's just be good neighbors Let's be good followers of Jesus. Let's open our eyes to the incredible realities, the fulfillment of prophecy that's taking place right now, right in front of us all. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I, even as I began this, I, I thanked you that you've provided this community, certainly with an imperfect man, but he's a good pastor and he's someone who has fought for the downtrodden, fought for the broken. He's been a peacemaker and he's paid the price. He's bared the brunt. He's received the criticisms, the attacks. Lord, we ask for every one of us in this room that in the days ahead, 
we would be people that would not shy away from suffering and pain and persecution, but we would do the right thing. We would be people who don't simply think about doing the right thing. We would actually do it. We would stand with the hated, the broken, the poor, the rejected, the hunted, the murdered, the persecuted. We would stand with your people. We would stand with your brethren. We would stand with you. Give us hearts soft hearts and backbones of steel that we could navigate the days ahead faithfully until that day. Even as you were anointed to preach the good news to the poor, Lord, we ask that by your spirit you would anoint us to stand with the poor, to stand with your people, and to follow you until the end. We thank you for these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.